Chapter Three of Poison Romance and Poison Mysteries by Charles John Samuel Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three Royal and Historic Poisoners. Poison appears to have been employed as a political agent from a very early period of history, and numerous stories have been handed down of royal personages who used this secret and deadly method of ridding themselves of troublesome individuals and removing enemies from their path. They also, at times, became the victims of jealous rivals by the same nefarious means. One of the earliest traditions we have of this kind is that of Frieza, who poisoned the queen Statyra during the reign of Artaxerxes II, Memnon, B.C. 405-359, by cutting her food with a poisoned knife. The notorious Nero doubtless resorted to the use of poison more than once, as may be inferred from the story of the death of his brother Britannicus, who, it is said, was poisoned by his orders. Britannicus was dining with his brother and the imperial family, and, as was the custom of the Romans, hot water was brought round by slaves to the table, the water being heated to varied degrees to suit the taste of the drinker. According to the story, the cup of water handed to Britannicus proved to be too hot, and he gave it back to the attendant slave, who added cold water to it, which addition is supposed to have contained the poison, for no sooner had he swallowed the draught than he fell back gasping for breath. His mother, Agrippina, and Octavia, his sister, who were also at the table, became terror-stricken, but Nero, unmoved, calmly remarked that he often had such fits in his youth without danger, and the banquet proceeded. It is thought probable that the poison given was prussic acid in some form. A curious superstition existed in early times, and is still entertained by the ignorant, that if the body rapidly decomposes after a sudden death, it is to be attributed to the effects of poison. So, when Britannicus died, it is recorded that the Romans attempted to conceal his discoloured face by means of paint. During the Roman period, poisoning was reduced to a fine art, and the skilled or professional poisoner obtained large amounts of money for his services. The Borgia's favourite method of administering a lethal dose was by means of a species of hypodermic injection. The greatest craft and cunning used to be exerted in order to introduce poison into the system, and there are many old traditions concerning the subtle methods employed, although a number of these are doubtless more legendary than correct. Thus Tissot states that John, King of Castile, owed his death to wearing a pair of boots which were supposed to have been impregnated with poison by a Turk. Henry the Sixth is said to have succumbed through wearing poisoned gloves, and Louis Fourteen and Pope Clement Seven through the fumes from a poisoned taper. King John is supposed to have been poisoned by matter extracted from a living toad placed in his wassail bowl, while Pope Alexander the Sixth is said also to have fallen a victim to poison, after which, according to the chronicler, his body presented a fearful spectacle. A document drawn up by Charles, King of Navarre, throws some light on the systematic manner in which the poisoning of obnoxious persons was carried out in medieval times. It is in the form of a commission to one Wonderton to poison Charles the Sixth, the Duke of Valois, brother of the King, and his uncles, the Dukes of Berry, Burgundy, and Bourbon. It runs, Go thou to Paris, thou canst do great service if thou wilt. Do what I tell thee. I will reward thee well. There is a thing which is called sublimed arsenic. If a man eat a bit the size of a pea, he will never survive. Thou wilt find it in Pampeluna, Bordeaux, Bayonne, and in all the good towns thou wilt pass at the apothecary's shops. Take it and powder it, and when thou shalt be in the house of the king, of the Count de Valois his brother, and the dukes of Berry, Burgundy, and Bourbon, 
draw near and betake thyself to the kitchen to the larder to the cellar or any other place where thy point can best be gained and put the powder in the soups meats or wines provided that thou canst do it secretly otherwise do it not it is satisfactory to learn that the miscreant who was entrusted with this diabolical commission was detected in time and executed in thirteen eighty four it is related of charles the ninth that having suspected one of his cooks of stealing two silver spoons he resolved to try the effect of bezoar which at that time was highly recommended as an antidote to poisons so thinking a good opportunity had arrived for testing its properties his majesty administered to the unfortunate cook first a large dose of corrosive sublimate and then a dose of the reputed antidote but the unlucky man fell a victim to the experiment and died in great agony in seven hours in spite of other efforts to save him there is an old tradition that king john also figured as a poisoner and got rid of the unfortunate maud fitzwalter by means of a poisoned egg the story is a romantic one and is related by hepworth dixon in her majesty's tower in the reign of king john the white tower received one of the first and fairest of a long line of female victims in that of Maud Fitzwalter, who was known to the singers of her time as Maud the Fair. The father of this beautiful girl was Robert, Lord Fitzwalter, of Castle Bayard on the Thames, one of John's most powerful and greatest barons. Yet the king, during, it is said, a fit of violence or temper with the queen, fell madly in love with the fair Maud, as neither the lady herself nor her powerful sire would listen to his disgraceful suit the king is said to have seized her by force at dunmo and brought her to the tower fitzwalter raised an outcry on which the king sent troops into castle bynard and his other houses and when the baron protested against these wrongs his master banished him from the realm fitzwalter fled to france with his wife and other children leaving poor maud in the tower where she suffered a daily insult in the king's unlawful suit but she remained obdurate and refused his offers on her proud and scornful answer to his overtures being heard john carried her up to the roof and locked her in the round turret standing on the northeast angle of the keep Maud's cage was the highest and chilliest den in the tower but neither cold solitude nor hunger could break her strength and at last in the rage of his disappointed love the king sent one of his minions to her room with a poisoned egg of which the brave girl ate and died bluff king hal at one period of his life was apprehensive of being poisoned and it was commonly believed that anne boleyn attempted to dose him it is recorded that the king in an interview with young prince henry burst into tears saying that he and his sister the princess mary might thank god for having escaped from the hands of that accursed and venomous harlot who had intended to poison them according to the french chronicles after the death of gaultier guiffard count buckingham in the early part of the twelfth century agnes his widow became enamoured with robert duke of normandy and attached herself in an illicit manner to him shortly after which time his wife sibylle died of poison pope alexander the sixth and his son the duke of valentinois employed arsenic to carry out their fiendish plans not only on their enemies but on their friends also thus perished by their hands the cardinals of capua and modena and alexander himself by a cup intended for adrian cardinal of cornetto who had invited the pope to a banquet in the vineyard of belvedere was destroyed instead of his host lucretia borgia famous in romance and song for her poisoning propensities was a daughter of pope alexander the sixth and sister of cesar borgia 
She married Giovanni Scorza, lord of Pizarro, in 1493, but being a woman of haughty disposition and evil temper, their life was anything but a happy one. And after living together for four years, Alexander dissolved the marriage and gave her to Alfonso II of Naples. Two years had barely passed before her second husband was assassinated by hired ruffians of Cesar Borgia. So Lucretia took unto herself a third husband, in the person of Alfonso d'Este, a son of the Duke of Ferrara. She led a wild and unhappy life, and was accused of poisoning, and almost every form of crime, although it is stated by several modern historians that many of these charges were unfounded. Although tradition has inflicted her with a bad character, she is said to have been a liberal patroness of art and literature in her time. She died in 1523. In 1536 the Dauphin, eldest son of Francis I, died suddenly, and suspicion attached to Sebastian Matacusili, a Ferrarese who held the part of cup-bearer bribed as was supposed by catherine of medicis in order to secure the crown to her husband henry duke of orleans who became dauphin in consequence of his elder brother's death the story of the countess of somerset who was tried with others for the murder of sir thomas overbury in the reign of james i forms an interesting episode in the history of romantic poisoning Robert, Earl of Essex, son of Queen Elizabeth's favourite, and who afterwards became commander-in-chief of the parliamentary forces, married, at the age of fourteen, Francis Howard, a younger daughter of the Earl of Suffolk, the bride being just a year younger than her husband. The match had been arranged, and brought about through the influence of relatives, who thought it expedient that the young bridegroom should be sent off to travel on the continent immediately after the marriage had taken place, and he remained away for three or four years. During this period the countess, who was brought up at court, developed into a very beautiful woman, but seems to have been equally unprincipled and capricious on the return of the earl from his travels she shrank from all advances on his part and showed the utmost repugnance to her husband on all occasions their dispositions were entirely different he loved retirement and wished to live a quiet country life while she who had been bred at court and accustomed to adulation and intrigue refused to leave town the king about this time had a number of young men of distinguished appearance and good looks attached to the court, and of these one Robert Carr at length became an exclusive favourite. Between him and the self-willed young countess there sprang up an attachment, which, at least on her side, amounted to infatuation. Her opportunities for meeting her lover were short and rare, and in this emergency she applied to a Mrs. Turner, who introduced her to Dr. Foreman, a noted astrologer and magician at that time, and he, by images made of wax and other devices of the black art, undertook to procure the love of Carr to the lady. At the same time he was also to practice against the earl in the opposite direction. These measures, however, were too slow for the wayward countess, and having gone to the utmost lengths with her inamorata, she insisted on a divorce and a legal marriage with him. One of Carr's greatest friends was Sir Thomas Overbury, a young courtier and a man of honour and kindly disposition. He was much against this intimacy, and besought his friend to break it off assuring him it would ruin his prospects and reputation if he married the lady. Carr unwisely made this known to the countess, who at once regarded Overbury as a bitter enemy, and resolved to do what she could to overthrow him. The pair plotted together with evident success, for the unfortunate Sir Thomas was shortly afterwards committed to the tower by an arbitrary mandate of the king next he was not allowed to see any visitors and finally his food was poisoned and after several unsuccessful attempts on his life he at last died from the effects of poison 
cantharides, nitrate of silver, spiders, arsenic, and last of all corrosive sublimate, are said to have been administered, in turn, to this unfortunate individual. Meanwhile the countess obtained a divorce from her husband, on the ground of impotency, and married Carr, who was soon afterward made Earl of Somerset by King James. Two years elapsed before the murder of Sir Thomas Overbury was brought to light, when the inferior criminals, Mrs. Turner and the others, were convicted and executed. But the Earl of Somerset and his Countess, although found guilty with their accomplices, received the royal pardon. The happiness of the Earl and Countess, however, was not of long duration, as it is stated they afterwards became so alienated from each other that they resided for years under the same roof with the most careful precautions that they might not by any chance come into each other's presence the mrs turner implicated in the crime is said to have been the first to introduce into england the yellow starch that was then applied to ladies ruffs her last request was that she should be hanged in a ruff dyed with her own yellow starch which is said to have been carried out According to some historians, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, Prime Minister and favourite of Queen Elizabeth, was a poisoner of the most diabolical description. His ambition to marry his royal mistress, who, shrewd woman as she was, seems to have had no insight into his unscrupulous character, was the cause of his moving every human obstacle from his path by insidious methods. The murder of his wife, Amy Robsart, was the first of a long series of murders, carried out, doubtless, at his instigation. He was next suspected of causing the death of Lord Sheffield, of whose lady he was an admirer. The Earl of Essex is said to have been another victim. His death is described in the language of the time as having been due to an extreme flux caused by an Italian receipt, the maker whereof was a surgeon that then was newly come to my lord from Italy, a cunning man and sure in operation. The inventor of this recipe was known as one Dr. Julio, who was said to be able to make a man die in what manner of sickness you will. The death of the Earl of Essex took place when on his way home from Ireland, with the object of revenging himself on the Earl of Leicester for his domestic wrongs. The next victim is said to have been Cardinal Chatillon, who, having accused the Earl of preventing the marriage of the Queen to the King of France, was journeying back to Dover when he was taken suddenly ill and died in Canterbury. Sir Nicholas Throckmorton, a wealthy city magnate and a tool of the Earl's, whom, tis said, he used to thwart the doings of the Lord Treasurer, Sir William Cecil, was another victim. Having heard that Sir Nicholas was revealing some of his secrets, he invited him one night to supper at his house in London, and at supper-time hurriedly went to the court, to which he said he had been called suddenly by Her Majesty. Sir Nicholas proceeded with the meal in his absence, and soon after was seized with a violent vomiting, from which he never recovered. According to an old chronicler, the day before his death he declared to a dear friend all the circumstances and cause of his complaint, which he affirmed plainly to be poison given him in a salad at supper inveighing most earnestly against the earl's cruelty and bloody disposition and affirming him to be the wickedest most perilous and perfidious man under heaven the chronicler continues and for his art of poisoning it is such now and reaching so far as he holdeth all his foes in england and elsewhere as also a good many of his friends in fear thereof and if it were known how many he hath dispatched in that way, would be marvellous to posterity. His body physician, one Dr. Bailey, openly proclaimed the fact that he knew of poisons which might be so tempered that they should kill the party afterwards at what time it should be appointed. Which argument belike, 
says the writer of Leicester's Commonwealth, pleased well his lordship of Leicester. The tool who carried out the murder of the Earl of Essex is said to have been one Crompton, yeoman of the bottles, together with Godwick Lloyd. Leicester was suspected of being the instigator of many murders, which probably he may have had nothing to do with, such was the feeling of dislike against him. Among others was Lady Lennox, who died in a mysterious manner shortly after being visited by the Earl. He is said to have kept in his employ several needy but unscrupulous physicians, ready to administer the Italian comfortive, as the poison was called, at his bidding. With the Earl of Essex, one Mrs. Alice Drackett, a godly gentlewoman, is also said to have been poisoned. This lady happened to be accompanying the Earl on her way towards her own house, when, after partaking of the same cup, she was also seized with violent pain and vomiting, which continued until she died, a day or two before the Earl succumbed. When she was dead, says the chronicler, her body was swollen into a monstrous bigness and deformity, whereof the good Earl, hearing the day following, lamented the case greatly, and said in the presence of his servants, Ah, poor Alice, the cup was not prepared for thee, albeit it was thy hard fortune to taste thereof. End of chapter 3